Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Damon Tordini. Uh, I'm one of the product managers here at Cockroach Systems. Welcome to Keeping the Lights On with SolarWorks Flow Simulation. This is going to be one of the first uh, analysis-oriented presentations we've got here at the Design and Manufacturing Conference for 2020. Uh, with me on the call is Terrence Wu. He's our Simulia application specialist. He's uh, going to be helping me out with some of the uh, Q&A and polls for this presentation. And uh, what we're going to be talking about this afternoon is how you can use uh, computational fluid dynamics to do thermal and airflow analysis in uh, some applications that might be relevant to a work from home environment that um, we all probably have experienced maybe for the first time in 2020. Um, we'll be looking at what the software can do and some live examples of it and uh, hopefully seeing how it relates to some of the uh, design work that you all are working on uh, this year and next. So I'm going to go ahead and disable my webcam here just so that everybody can stay focused on the screen and we'll get right into the presentation. So what we're going to look at in uh, this presentation is uh, an overview of how the computational fluid dynamics tool inside SOLIDWORKS, which we call SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation, um, enables us to do thermal analysis on devices in such a way that, um, you know, in a lot of cases, even if you weren't planning on trying to manufacture or prototype something in order to see if it works in the real world, it's still easy enough to justify taking the time to run one of these simulations, uh, even if it's just the difference between doing that and, you know, running down to a store and grabbing a product. And, uh, and that's the whole idea behind these tools is to, of course, make it as easy as possible to compare what happens when you change something about either uh, the product's design or maybe the, the setup or the real world case that it's in. And uh, being as a lot of us were stuck from home, that would be an, an interesting topic that's hopefully relatable um, to a lot of you out there. So I don't know about everybody else, but but uh, personally for me, since the entire uh, coronavirus pandemic situation started earlier this year, I've um, been working from home um, probably about 95% of the time. And uh, personally where I live in Southern California, that has it's been uh, not very helpful for my electric bills. Uh, some of you may know that uh, we've struggled with some severe heat waves in Southern California this year, which have also triggered a lot of wildfires. And because of that, our local utility, SoCal Edison, has been um, sending out a lot of warnings about electricity usage. And of course, you know our electricity rates are not particularly low. Um, so, you know, I, in the interest of just trying to see what I could do to lower my own electric bill and maybe, uh, you know, try to uh, contribute a little bit, not not uh, make the blackouts worse, so I did a couple of examples to see what I could do to make some of the things in my own home a little more efficient, use a little less electricity, uh, electricity and be a, more, a little more effective. Um, so you can see right there is just a light fixture in one of the rooms in my house. and. I was curious what would happen if we um, maybe took an existing lighting product and saw, you know, how it worked in in uh, sort of ideal case, and then also what would happen if I if I put that product in my light fixture, would it still work? And uh, of course, it'd be interesting to figure out, even if I wasn't the designer of that light itself, you know, what would happen um, in that case? Would it still work? Is there a way that I could improve the design, or maybe something that needs to be done about that fixture to make it work properly? And so, you know, luckily, those are the types of questions that can be answered uh, by the tools that we at Hawkridge Systems offer in the sim uh, simulation family. You know, so the um, software products that let you take a 3D design that you may have already created in SolidWorks and subject it to some kind of real world conditions to see what the performance would be in that situation. And, and if you're familiar with some of the um, simulation tools that are out there on the market, um, you probably know that there are different types of simulation that you can perform. And at Hawkridge, the portfolio of analysis products that we offer covers almost a full range of different kinds of physics that you might want to simulate and analyze. Everything from a static stress analysis to vibration, manufacturing analysis, and of course, thermal analysis. And so when you're talking about some sort of electronic devices like LED lights, for example, um, that have some kind of temperature limit to them, that thermal analysis and probably the airflow, fluid flow analysis related to it is gonna be the most important. 
And so luckily, if you are designing a product like that, or maybe testing out the real world usage of that kind of a product in SolidWorks, there is a product that will operate directly within that SOLIDWORKS environment called SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation. And the purpose of that is to perform this thermal and fluid flow analysis. Uh, and, and basically the idea here is that you'll be able to analyze the airflow patterns and the temperatures inside the components of this kind of de device without having to um, export your model to some other interface or recreate it in any way. Um, and that way that you can sort of almost in real time judge what the performance characteristics of the design will be, whether you need to move the components around, change the cooling solution by you know, adding heat sinks or fans or whatever you wanna do. And, and basically this product is kind of geared towards the typical uh, mechanical engineer uh, that would be using SOLIDWORKS in these cases so that Really, the only info you need to put into the software are the real world conditions, you know, not these abstract, um, you know, solver parameters or things that you may not be familiar with. So what we could use SOLIDWORKS flow simulation for would be a case study like this LED light bulb that um, I'm going to see uh, if it would you know, sort of work in my own home environment very well. So this thing, of course, uh, has some thermal constraints to it because LEDs are basically a chip, just like any other, a very small chip that uh, basically, you know, uses energy to, to produce light instead of crunching math. And uh, it's got a heat sink on it. Um, this is kind of a higher power LED. So it's got a pretty beefy heat sink there made out of copper and got some fins, of course. And there's a vent design to, try to get airflow up through this thing past the heat sink fins to pull the heat out. Um, and it's got uh, some of these particular LED bulbs from Cree on the board itself down below. Um, and so what we'd like to do, you know, if we were the designer of this LED light is make sure that it's gonna operate, of course, kind of uh, as best as it can in, in the average real world scenario. You know, maybe if we were the designer, we would explore what would happen with different versions of the heat sink. Um, and so that's what SOLIDWORKS flow simulation would let us do. And basically we could go into the software here and open up that 3D model and run a, what we call natural convection, you know, external airflow analysis, just to see if we have a certain amount of heat and these various material properties and other things, what kind of airflow would we get? And what would happen if we adjusted the design of the bulb and, you know, uh, sort of tried to compare which of these would, would work better or worse. And so, of course, if you uh, were the person designing the enclosure or the other mechanical aspects of this product, you would take the 3D model and turn on SOLIDWORKS flow simulation here. And basically what this software would let you do is create the analysis and set up some basic external physical conditions and and then um, see what would happen in this baseline design. So for example, there's sort of a wizard interface that would let you specify whether, for example, you've got heat conduction in these solid materials, whether you've got radiation that uh, is part of the heat transfer as well. Of course, any kind of you know, lighting product has both um, visible radiation as well as thermal radiation. And we can turn on physics like gravity. The, you know, this particular product uh, doesn't have any fans in it. We don't want it to rely on you know, mechanical uh, forced air cooling. That'd be loud and you know, not very reliable. So we, uh, we probably wanna make sure that, that gravity is enough to keep it cool. And so we could turn that on and make sure it's, it's pointed in the right direction. And then of course, we'd be able to specify what kinds of fluids are present in this product, which in this case would be air. You know, if obviously you had some uh, unusual, maybe water-cooled lighting product, then of course you could do that as well with some of the other fluids in this library. But most stuff is, is probably air-cooled in the real world. And so we can simply select that from the gases menu here. And then of course you can put in those ambient conditions that we talked about. Uh, for example, what the temperature in the room is, you know, maybe this device is meant to operate even on a you know, relatively hot day, 35 degrees C in the room or something like that. Or if there's some kind of air current in the room from, you know, the HVAC system or some fans, you could plug in velocity parameters to do that. 
And so we're able to run this kind of analysis, you know, without any kind of inlet or outlet conditions or, you know, uh, fans or anything like that, because this is what we call it an external simulation. And the program is going to figure out what the airflow is doing inside this cube that you see here, which we call the computational domain. So there's no need to create any kind of a sealed box, sealed container, or to put in um, some sort of a flow rate. The air is simply going to flow through this device based on gravity and based on the heat. Uh, and so in that sense, it's sort of a multi-physics simulation. Both the heat transfer and the fluid flow are interdependent, and the solver is going to figure out what that is for us. So the setup, because of that, is pretty straightforward here. All we really needed to do was um, put in some of those environmental conditions and then put in some material properties, like, for example, the housing here is made out of plastic. And we've got an aluminum heat spreader down there on the back side of the PCB. And these materials here can be imported from your SolidWorks feature tree, if that's something that you normally specify in your everyday work. Or you can define them from the flow simulation library, too, which uh, in some cases is beneficial because I'll have a little more uh, accurate properties. You know, for example, aluminum has um, some uh, temperature dependent curves in here for the thermal conductivity. You know, you're, as you might be aware, the thermal properties of some of these metals and other things changes with temperature. So we can put in those properties. And of course, all the other uh, physics uh, for um, you know, the heat generation in the chips, which we'll come back to in a moment, um, things like the circuit board, and we can get some results. Of course, it would take about five minutes or so to run this analysis, um, which would be possible right here on our uh, local machine. We can see that uh, it would solve locally here and uh, you know, use all of the processor cores that are located on this machine, like so. And thankfully, I've already solved this one, so it's not going to take us uh, too long to get back to our results here, but we'd end up with a baseline. And what we're looking for in this particular case is what we call the steady state operation. Um, we're just trying to find out how hot would this thing get if we let it running all day long, left it, left it um, sitting in that room with steady conditions. And of course, we get um, some key temperature results. These are what we'd call goals or things like the LED themselves or the, or the circuit board, which of course had some um, kind of temperature requirements to them from that manufacturer. And then we'd have visual properties that we could look at, you know, things like the velocity patterns, the temperature distributions, and uh, of course the temperatures of the surfaces of the object themselves. So all of these things are, are what we would use to figure out what the baseline design of the product should look like. Now, if you were the designer of this product, you probably would try to figure out what you can do to improve the design as well. And because of that, uh, you'd wanna try out a lot of different variations, most likely. That could be variations in the setup conditions or variations in the geometry or other things like that. And luckily, because this tool is operating inside SolidWorks, we can create something called a parametric study that will let us make changes to the model just by modifying dimensions of some of the sketches and features that we have already created to see what those comparisons will do. So for example, here I could create um, a parametric study to modify the number of fins in my heat sink. It would just be a matter of creating this, this uh, parametric uh, interface here, which uh, has some different modes to it, one of which is an optimization mode, and then specify which of those dimensions we want to modify. So in this case, you can see that I've selected this dimension that uh, refers to the number of instances in the circular pattern of the fins on that heat sink. And the baseline design uh, was 40 here, but we could try 60, 80, 100. Maybe we would even go down to 20 and see what happens um, to the temperatures in these scenarios. So this is something that was kind of done a long time ago by the person who originally designed this LED bulb. Uh, to do this kind of a trade study to see what are the, the pros and cons of each. Obviously, the uh, downside of adding more fin would probably be higher material costs, higher manufacturing costs, et cetera. And by doing this kind of a trade study, what you would be able to find out is which of these designs is best on average in this sort of an ideal scenario. So, of course, at a certain point, if you have a heat sink and you add more fins, what you probably end up doing is 
restricting the airflow. So there's always this trade-off in, in, in uh, almost any design change. And in this case, it's um, both cost and um, you know, reduction of, of the cooling capacity, even though you've got more fins and more surface area. So that's why the baseline design of this bulb has 40 fins in it. You can see from this trade study comparison, that was the one with the lowest temperatures. And luckily it was pretty much the second cheapest to manufacture. So this was something that had kind of been done before. And, um, you know, of course, it, it looks like this would be a successful product that meets the temperature requirements of the LEDs that uh, would have been given to us by the manufacturer. But this bulb was obviously meant to be used in a particular situation where you've got those vents on the top that are going to contribute to the cooling and, and the successful operation of the bulb. So what I wanted to, to ask myself one of these days when I was uh, sitting at home, kind of bored, to be honest, uh, was what, you know, what would happen if I put that bulb in one of my light fixtures? Most of my light fixtures don't have vents on the top. You know, this is just a uh, glass cover, uh, especially if it's kind of the old retro type that um, is just a big dish. And uh, my first thought was that's probably not gonna uh, allow the vents to work as well anymore because that air is not going to have anywhere to go. So that was the first thing I wanted to do, is, uh, create another variation of this model um, and test that out. Because even though this is a product that already has been designed in the past, um, it's still a lot easier for me to set up and run a simulation than go out and buy one of these bulbs. I didn't really know where to find one, to be honest. Um, and the fixture was already in my house, so you know, buying a different fixture wasn't really an option either. You know, and in the old days of analysis, that might have sounded like a crazy proposition, but because these things typically in, in solid flow simulation can be run in an hour or two, it makes sense to do that kind of a what if, even if you are not planning on spending a bunch of money on, on materials or prototyping and testing. So that's what I wanted to find out is uh, what would happen in when I install the bulb and as you'll see in a moment here, um, part of the reason why I'm going to be able to get an accurate result in that sort of a scenario is by using some of the extra capabilities in the add-on modules for flow simulation, which are the electronics cooling and HVAC add-on modules. And that's going to improve the realism of this simulation. Now, while uh, we're switching back over here, I'm going to have Terrence pop up a poll, if he hasn't done so already, just to check how many of you have also been working from home and might have um, been in a similar uh, you know, situation to me. What happens if I take this product that somebody else designed under ideal scenario and, and used it in the real world? So that's what I'm going to try to find out here. Does this cooling solution with the vents on that case of the bulb no longer work? and how much heat gets trapped by the glass there from that light fixture. So if I go back into SolidWorks, what you'll see is that I created another configuration of the 3D model to test out this, this question. So first, I made another configuration from my assembly. Those of you familiar with SolidWorks know that you can right click on the top name of the assembly from the configurations tab and simply say add configuration. And that'll let you uh, create another very version of this assembly where you can add extra components, switch the uh, version of the components that are already in the 3D model and make other changes like that. And so I made a configuration here called in fixture. And so this isn't uh, an exact replica, but I mocked up an approximation of that light fixture in my SOLIDWORKS assembly here, which is basically just a simple socket, a metal socket with a glass cover that is just a simple revolve feature, you know, pretty basic um, sketch here and a pretty basic SOLIDWORKS, um, you know, dimensioning practices. And actually, you'll notice that the, I didn't even make a separate part for this. This is just a virtual component inside my assembly, um, since it's you know, not something that I'm actually going to be making a drawing of or, or producing. I just, you know, mock this up for simulation purposes. So because I had already had a simulation done on the baseline product here of the LED bulb. Um, the good news is that I didn't have to start from scratch. Anytime you've created these simulations in flow simulation, uh, what you can do is click on it 
and use something called the clone command. So this allows us to copy the exact setup from the previous analysis to the new configuration of the assembly. And it'll automatically bring over the same set of conditions, the same assumptions. And all we'll have to do is uh, add in any new information from the new design or the new scenario. So what I did here was since this new configuration represented the light installed in the fixture, is that I just had to add the material for that uh, for the cover. So you can see here, there's another material in the tree called glass, which I have assigned to the picture. And that one, uh, it was actually in the flow simulation engineering database already, but I just made a user defined version of it and uh, tweaked the properties a little bit. It's just a solid material like any other. And so of course that uh, is now gonna conduct heat, but more importantly, the fact that there's a cover there is gonna trap air inside and potentially cause this thing to heat up. Now we had radiation already enabled in this simulation, um, but we were using the default assumption of black body walls for all the materials, which is usually a good idea anytime you're dealing with you know, typical painted surfaces. Um, but for something like a piece of glass, you might wanna switch that to another uh, radiative surface type uh, by which you're, you're defining the emissivity. And that of course defines how much radiation gets absorbed by that surface and how much gets reflected. So just to be safe here, I had defined this glass cover as a white body wall uh, to reflect all the radiation back at the bulb, just, just in case you know uh, that's kind of the effect it has, I figured that'd be kind of the worst case scenario. Now, the reason why I'm confident that I'm gonna get accurate temperature results uh, by making this change is partly due to the way that I've defined the electronic components on the board themselves. And this was already done, so I didn't have to change this in any way. Um, but it's going to more accurately reflect the actual internal temperature of the LED because it's a special feature that has been added to SOLIDWORKS flow simulation for components on a PCB that have defined thermal models. So, you know, in the old days, you would basically uh, take your component on a circuit board and model it as some kind of solid block, as you can see these LEDs are here. And you'd have to guess at what the solid material properties would be of this thing and, and assign that. But in this case, we knew what the actual vendor of the LED was, it was this company called Cree. And on the spec sheet, if you look it up, what they have are not you know, solid mechanical properties like a thermal conductivity. Instead, they have thermal resistance values. Specifically, they're usually called theta JC and theta JB thermal resistance values. That's the thermal resistance from the inside of the chip, what we call the junction, down to the board and also up to the top of the case. And this is a much better way to simulate the component because that way the analysis will know how much heat normally tries to get down to the board and how much tries to get out. You can see here that the JC junction case thermal resistance for this chip is super high compared to the, the board, which means that basically all the heat needs to actually get down to the board. And in this particular design, you know, I, I haven't tried to put any kind of heat dissipation on the top of the bulb, which probably wouldn't make sense because that probably would mess up the light output. But if I if I had tried to do that, what I would see is that it is basically ineffective because that resistance is so high, the heat can't get out the top anyways. Again, that makes sense. That's where the diode is. That's where the light comes out. So whatever I do to the design to try to cool this thing is gonna um, only really matter related to how much the heat gets out the back of the LED to the board. So that is gonna ensure that the temperatures here are accurately reflecting you know, what happens to that heat spreader or the heat sink or, or um, those other effects in the back there. And then this feature, of course, also lets me put in the heat power output of that LED and also is, is how I'm able to get that measurement of what that internal junction temperature is. So again, if I use the old school approach, that would be a lot less realistic and I would be a lot less confident that I'm still getting the accurate results of what would happen if I put this into a fixture. You know, when you use um, less realistic assumptions, the software becomes much more uh, about comparative changes only rather than real world situations. Similar to that, we've also got a feature in this electronics cooling module 
for defining the layers of the circuit board that the LEDs are located on. Again, the old school approach would have been to just apply a material to this and, and guess at what the thermal conductivity is. But using this printed circuit board feature, the software allows us to go in here and define what the actual conducting layers of the board are. Uh, this is, for example, is a two single two power board where you would type in the thickness of those layers. And then we can also plug in the coverage of the copper in that board. And that will figure out what the effective solid um, conductivity properties are for us without having to guess. And I could also go in and try to add more detail if, you know, for example, there were vias or something pulling heat through the board. Um, but for right now, I can use this kind of default um, board stack up, which will be a lot more accurate than just putting a solid material on there. So because I have this added confidence and because I put in a few other sort of real world things like the thermal tape here, uh, that's on the back side of the uh, aluminum heat spreader there. That's how the heat sink was attached to that heat spreader, which again uh, is also uh, enabled by that electronics cooling add-on module because of this library of thermal um, tape, thermal pad. Again, that's gonna uh, improve the realism a lot. And uh, as it turns out, if I were to run this simulation, as you might expect, what we find is that uh, it's trapping the air. It traps the air. And obviously because of that, the uh, temperatures in the device go up and um, it's not vented the way it's supposed to be. So the next question I asked myself was, could I modify that picture? I really liked the way it looked and I didn't want to buy a new one. And, you know, I didn't uh, want to go, uh, you know, have to find a bulb that uh, was cooled in a different way because probably any bulb out there is going to have some kind of, a, you know, venting solution to it if it's this type of a high powered bulb. So I'll try to ask myself what happens if I grab my drill and you know pop a bunch of holes in the top of that fixture. Would that be enough to make it work the way it was supposed to again? So again though the benefit of being integrated in the SOLIDWORKS environment shows through. I, I don't even really need to modify the existing dimensions or sketches of the fixture um, in this situation, because all I really wanted to do was find out what would happen if I did some, put some holes in the top. Uh, so this was a simple hole wizard feature. Some of you are probably familiar with the hole wizard. It's an easy way to add a hole um, from uh, you know standard sizes and, and full standards. So this is a size X hole, ANSI inch standard, um, which I don't remember offhand if I actually have that size drill bit, but I could probably get one easily enough. And uh, you know, just for fun, I decided to find out what would happen if I did nine of those holes. So nine of them all the way around, um, which hopefully is still not not uh, super visible, you know, from the angle you normally see this thing at. And so again, because of the fact that I have already created the simulation, I can simply do a clone command, and that would allow me to rerun the analysis on the same assembly, but with this modified version of the enclosure. And my hope would be that the air can now escape again the way it was supposed to, and the bulb temperatures will, will go back down. So again, I would hit run and would have done the computation. And what I hopefully would see is something like this. Temperatures down there in the 30s and 40s. And then of course I can change the angle of my cup plot here, which is sort of a section view of the different um, results. And you can see right there, this is kind of an asymmetric hole pattern. And so the, at the current place I'm looking at with my cut plot, the air is kind of escaping out the side there. And that's making the temperatures go down a little bit. Um, and of course, what I could do is you know, dig into all these results more with things like the probe tool to figure out you know, where, where is really the hot spot uh, on this side versus the other? What's the difference in temperatures? What are the airflow patterns on the inside of the casing look like? And of course, I can also look at all of these fluid flow trajectories in three dimensions too. And I can color them with all kinds of different properties like, for example, velocity, uh, temperature, pressure, and so on.
Hey, Damon, just going to interrupt you here. Uh, we've got a question on the side here from Elliot Evans. Um, he's asking about specifying layers for the LED and how you might deal with resistance through a bonding agent like a, a solder. Ah, great question, Terrence. Uh, and Elliot, too. Um, so going back to that real quick, that's part of where this two resistor component is super useful because typically, and it obviously depends on the manufacturer of the chip, but typically when these junction decays and junction to board thermal resistance properties are developed, um, those are those are obtained by a real world test where they actually have mounted the component onto the board. And essentially they're just measuring the temperature with, you know, with uh, thermocouples and they're figuring out what the total thermal resistance is, you know, including how it's soldered to the board, for example. So that should be factored in already to those thermal resistance numbers. But if for some reason you were adding extra thermal resistance on top of what would have been present in their original test, which is probably more applicable to like the junction to case resistance, you know, if you were putting uh, like an additional thermal pad on the top of the chip um, and then putting a heat sink there, that's where those thermal resistance conditions could come in. So I could add an extra contact resistance on top of the chip um you know to add more resistance to what was already there but as far as what goes down to the board um that probably would have already been accounted for in that resistance number that they gave you so it's up to you you can add more if you want but um if you call them up and ask what their test conditions were like i would imagine it's already accounted for okay awesome stuff thanks for answering that damon what you get back to your presentation here. And Elliot, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to shoot those across as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so of course, getting back to this comparison, you know, to really figure out which of these uh, designs is better. And if, you know, drilling holes in the top of my, you know, previously nice looking light fixture was, was worth it. Of course, we can also um, compare the results. And that's one of the best things about viewing the results in, in SOLIDWORKS flow simulation is being able to look side by side at the same plot uh, between two different projects. And so again, it, if it wasn't already clear, uh, by punking, punching those holes in the top of that fixture, I'm um, letting some of the air out, and of course I'm dropping temperatures you know, pretty significantly. It looks like about at least 10 degrees, maybe 15 degrees in some of the areas there. So again, even though this wasn't a product that I have to worry about tooling for or any of that, it was still worth it for me to spend an hour running this simulation before I go down to Home Depot and buy a different light fixture. Now, it's always beneficial if, if what you're trying to do is test a specific, you know, real world installation for a product like this to you know, maximize the realism. Again, accounting for how the chip was soldered to the board, like I just mentioned, or any other uh, physical characteristics. So some other ideas for how we could continue to improve the realism uh, of this simulation. Uh, one of them would be to change how the power generation is defined in the LED. So what we assumed for this simulation was that it was just a constant uh, 0.5 watts for each of the LEDs that were on um, the board. And there were 12 of them. So that was a total of, of uh, six watts. But as you probably are aware, most chips, especially LEDs, don't have a constant power output. In a lot of cases, it uh, changes depending on the temperature of the chip because they get less efficient. So if we wanted to put in some sort of temperature dependency, we could actually link this heat power condition with the dependency field um, to be dependent on the temperature of the chip itself, that junction temperature that the uh, feature was measuring for us. So if the temperature were to go up, that would make the heat generation go up. And it could be some sort of a feedback loop that makes you know small changes a lot worse than we realized. So definitely one way to increase realism there. Another one would be, we talked about how radiation was important. You know, radiative heat transfer was important um, to get the right results here. But we were treating all of the solid materials in that, that analysis as regular sort of opaque solids that just had an emissivity value to them. And one of the things that that HVAC module also can do with the more advanced radiation is to do the uh, absort, uh, absorptivity calculations through the solid material 
based on the spectrum of the light. So if you have materials that, for example, filter out higher wavelength blue light, uh, but allow you know, warmer light to pass through more easily, or for example, if you have something that uh, blocks out uh, you know, infrared, let's say, that's gonna potentially change the amount of heat absorption through the lens or the housing or other transparent components a lot. Um, that's especially important in things like um, glazing for um, windows, you know, for office buildings. And so that could be plugged in as well, as well as the spectrum of the light being emitted by the LEDs themselves. That's another thing we could input there. The, the default in the library is for just daylight, but you could plug in a custom one. And so again, that would account for the specific um, uh, tint and filter um, properties of any of those transparent materials. And of course, on top of all of that, we could also, instead of running a steady state analysis, which is what we were doing here, we could switch to a time dependent analysis and find out what would happen if we turn the light on and let it run maybe for an hour. You know, does it actually warm up all the way and get to that steady state temperature? Or, um, the, you know, is, is it able to stay at lower temperatures? Um, for a longer amount of time. All of those are ways that we could, again, add more realism when we're trying to mimic a specific real world case rather than just doing a comparison of design A versus design B. Now, of course, you know, the, uh, these capabilities in SOLIDWORKS flow simulation are not just useful for like home hobbyists like me, you know, they're used in the design and manufacturing of almost every component in the supply of the electricity as well. You know, in, in no matter what type of electricity generation you're referring to, whether it's natural gas or wind or geothermal or whatever, you probably have industrial equipment and machinery that can um, be used, uh, or can be simulated, I should say, in a software like this, because it can do the fluid flow and the heat transfer simultaneously. So things like heat exchangers, turbines, et cetera. Uh, we've got companies using this software to design wind turbines, of course, to figure out uh, how much power they would generate under a specific wind speed, you know, based on the RPM. And we also have companies that use this for things like solar panels as well, figuring out uh, if the solar panel will overheat or not in a, in a particular environment. And also things like wind loading on the solar panels. What's the best orientation on the rooftop? So, of course, you know, uh, uh, really, you can you can use this to figure out if there are ways to uh, generate more electricity in a cleaner way and cheaper, rather than just you know what kind of light fixture you should put the thing in. Of course, there are plenty of other you know sort of home hobbyist uh, applications for something like this. And another one that I did one day, just uh, out of sort of boredom, was um, trying to figure out what the best fan setup in my house was. I uh, just did a quick um, 2D drawing of the floor plan of my house there and again in SOLIDWORKS and luckily that was pretty much just an extrude feature and I just played around with putting some um, fan conditions in different spots of the house to figure out what were the airflow patterns like and which one was um, best for pulling the air through the house fast enough to counteract the solar heating that was coming you know burning up the, the roof of my house and uh, you can see there those would be the, those flow trajectories again that we talked about showing the recirculation in the house and the temperature of the air. Um, and as it turns out that, you know, based on the simulation I ran, I went out and bought a, a second a box fan, got a good cross breeze going through my house, and it actually keeps the place just as cool as the AC, to be honest, which is a lot cheaper. Now, some of the uh, enhancements in SOLIDWORKS 2021 that helped me do this kind of simulation were mostly on the visual side with the plots. Uh, one of them is that uh, you, you may have seen back there in the software, I used the probe tool to look at the temperature in specific locations. Uh, and in addition to that, you can show the maximum or minimum value on a result plot. And now in 2020, 2021, excuse me, SOLIDWORKS 2021, if you crop the cut plots, uh, that will automatically update the little call out for the max temperature, which is really cool because previously it stayed where it was and showed you what the max temperature was in some you know, part of the plot that you weren't currently looking at, which wasn't as useful. So that will move around dynamically for you now. And it's easier also to filter out bodies that you've hidden from your simulation so that you can uh, you know, make sure you, you haven't accidentally hidden a part when you meant to exclude it from your simulation altogether. 
So, you know, it might, might actually be uh, blocking the airflow when you didn't realize it. And also what's cool now is that once you set up all these visual plots, you know, it could be, for example, surface plots with the temperature and the flow trajectories around them. If you get it all just right with the appearances that you want, you want to reuse that in the future, you can now create what we call a scene to save all of those plots with their exact visual parameters so that you can go to a completely different model and a completely different simulation and load up that scene to recreate them with the same exact visual parameters. You won't have to do that from scratch anymore. Now, the last thing that I thought I would do just for fun was uh, since I've been working from home so much, I was worried about my Wi-Fi signal. And uh, what I did one day is I downloaded one of these Wi-Fi signal strength applications for your phone where you can just walk around your house and see what kind of a signal you're getting. As I suspected, um, I previously had the, the router in the living room of my house and I was getting a terrible signal back in the office. It wasn't good enough. So I did a, a little um, walk around with this app to confirm that. And I thought, you know, what could I do to improve the signal strength? And obviously moving the router would be the number one thing. But if I was the, the uh, person designing that router and I was trying to predict how well the signal would get through something like, you know, the uh, loud and plaster walls in, in an old house, like the one where I live, that would be another thing that I might want to simulate. And just like we saw that there were some applications for thermal analysis, there's also software out there for what we call electromagnetic interference simulation as well. And the one that we offer here at Hawkridge Systems is called CST Studio Suite. Uh, so this is under what we call the Simulia brand of uh, more high-end kind of uh, dedicated analyst level tools. And this simulates the three-dimensional electromagnetic fields coming from connected devices, you know, whether that would be a, you know, a router or a wearable um, you know, connected device like a watch or your phone, and it can simulate how well the signal at all of the different um, areas of the spectrum, you know, high frequency, low frequency, whatever, um, pass through and around different materials and also whether they interfere with each other. Um, and so that's how these devices are often designed, you know, to make sure that they get a good signal and don't interfere with the other um, equipment in your home. And obviously, you know, this is a little more involved than a thermal analysis to the point where I, I didn't run that simulation just to uh, figure out what would happen when I moved my router. But if it was, you know, maybe, a, you know, a more dedicated installation type environment, like an office building that needed an entire, you know, router network, this kind of simulation would, would be able to answer that question. What would be the optimal placement of those devices and uh, what parts of the spectrum would I be most concerned about as far as getting the signal through the material? So just an example of how you can simulate almost any of the physics that you might already be trying to test for in a real world physical test on, on the shop floor. Of course, you know, part of the reason why we're able to uh, provide you guys with applications and, and examples of tools that can solve all these problems is the experience we have on the, the dedicated Hawkridge simulation team of which myself and Terrence are members. We have uh, uh, about eight different software tools now that we specialize in from, from both the SOLIDWORKS and the Simulia brands. And we use those tools for consulting and other analysis services and support through Hawkridge. And uh, we've seen quite a lot uh, over the years, you know, thanks to all the uh, applications that we've heard about from customers like you guys. So um, let us know if you have a question about if something can be simulated, what tool would it require? and uh, how difficult is it to do? We can probably let you know if it's uh, is something that we've seen before. Of course, there are um, plenty of customers that we are privileged to work with at Hawkridge, but some of the big ones that you might have heard of also uh, use these same tools that we've just discussed. Uh, all of the companies you see on here, in fact, have at least one license of SOLIDWORKS flow simulation, and they use it from everything from thermal analysis of the devices that uh, they manufacture to aerodynamics. Um, and, uh, and this is largely because of the fact that it's so easy to use that almost any SOLIDWORKS mechanical engineer can, can take advantage of it. So with that, uh, we'll stick around here and see if there are any last questions to wrap up. Um, but otherwise, thanks for your time. I hope it was informative and I uh, hope you got a good look at 
and how you might use this software um, even for your own uh, daily lives rather than uh, making something on the shop floor. Thank <music> you.